Just by looking around us, we can see all of the wonders and beauty that our world has to offer. Some have experienced much more than that, though. A different plane of reality that coexists with the one we experience through our bodily senses of sight, sound, taste, and feeling. A mystical place known as the astral plane or astral world. Before we get started, we need to understand what an astral body is. Let's take a deeper look, shall we? An astral body is a subtle body, posited by many philosophers, intermediate between the intelligent soul and the mental body, composed of a subtle material. The concept was described in the philosophy of Plato. It is related to an astral plane which consists of the planetary heavens of astrology. The term was also adopted by 19th century theosophists and neo-Rosicrucians. The idea is rooted in common, worldwide religious accounts of the afterlife in which the soul's journey, or ascent, is described in such terms as an ecstatic, mystical, or out-of-body experience, wherein the spiritual traveler leaves the physical body and travels in his, or her, subtle body, also known as the dream body, or astral body, into higher realms. Hence, the many kinds of heavens, hells, and purgatorial existences believed in by followers of innumerable religions may also be understood as astral phenomena. The astral body is sometimes said to be visible as an aura of swirling colors. It is widely linked today with out-of-body experiences or astral projection. The word astral means of the stars. Thus the astral plane, consisting of the celestial spheres, is held to be an astrological phenomenon. The whole of the astral portion of our Earth and of the physical planets, together with the purely astral planets of our system, make up collectively the astral body of the solar logos. There are seven types of astral matter by means of which psychic changes occur periodically. Such ideas greatly influenced medieval religious thought and are visible in the Renaissance medicine of Paracelsus and Servetus. In the Romantic era, alongside the discovery of electromagnetism and the nervous system, there came a new interest in the spirit world. Franz Anton Mesmer, German physician whose system of therapeutics, known as mesmerism, was the forerunner of the modern practice of hypnotism, spoke of the stars, animal magnetism, and magnetic fluids. In 1801, the English occultist Francis Barrett wrote of a herb's excellent astral and magnetic powers for herbalists had categorized herbs according to their supposed correspondence with the seven planetary influences. In the mid-19th century, the French occultist Eliphaz Levi wrote much of the astral light, a factor he considered of key importance to magic, alongside the power of will and the doctrine of correspondences. He considered the astral light the medium of all light energy and movement, describing it in terms that recall both mesmer and the luminiferous ether. Levi's idea of the astral was to have much influence in the English-speaking world through the teachings of the Golden Dawn, but it was also taken up by Helena Blavatsky and discussed in the key work of Theosophy, the Secret Doctrine. Levi seems to have been regarded by later Theosophists as the immediate source from which the term was adopted into their sevenfold schema of planes and bodies, though there was slight confusion as to the term's proper use. Blavatsky frequently used the term astral body in connection with the Indian linga sharira, which is one of the seven principles of human life. However, she said that there are various astral bodies. For example, she talked of one as being constituted by the lower manners and volition, karma. According to the theosophical founder, William Q. Judge, there are many names for the astral body. Here are a few. Linga, Sharira, Sanskrit meaning design body, and the best one of all, ethereal double, phantom, wraith, apparition, doppelganger, 
personal man, para-spirit, irrational soul, animal soul, Buddha, elementary, spook, devil, demon. Some of these apply only to the astral body when devoid of the corpus after death. According to Max Heindel's Rosicrucian writings, the desire body is made of desire stuff from which human beings form feelings and emotions. It is said to appear to spiritual sight as an ovoid cloud extending from 16 to 20 inches beyond the physical body. It has a number of whirling vortices or chakras and from the main vortex in the region of the liver there's a constant flow which radiates and returns. The desire body exhibits colors that vary in every person according to his or her temperament and mood. However, the astral body or soul body must be evolved by means of the work of transmutation and will eventually be evolved by humanity as a whole. According to Heindel, the term astral body was employed by the medieval alchemists because of the ability it conferred to transverse the starry regions. The astral body is regarded as the philosopher's stone or living stone of the alchemist, the wedding garment of the Gospel of Matthew, and the soul body that Paul mentions in the first epistle to the Corinthians. Many other popular accounts of post-theosophical ideas appeared in the late 20th century. Barbara Brennan's Hands of Light distinguishes between the emotional body and the astral body. She sees these as two distinct layers in the seven-layered human energy field. The emotional body pertains to the physical universe, the astral body to the astral world. The mother, sometimes referred to the astral body, and experiences on the astral plane. The Indian master Osho occasionally made use of a modified theosophical terminology. According to Samael Aun Weor, who popularized theosophical thought in Latin America, the astral body is the part of human soul related to emotions, represented by the Sephira Had in the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. However, the common person only has a Kamarupa, body of desire or lunar astral body, a body related to animal emotions, passions and desires, while the true human emotional vehicle is the solar astral body which can be crystallized through tantric sex. The solar astral body is the first mediator between the cosmic Christ, Chakma, and the individual human soul. Many scientists claim there is no scientific evidence that an astral body exists. Psychologists like Donovan Rockliffe, who assumes the existence of the astral body to be a myth, have written that delusions and hallucinations due to anesthesia or hysteria have undoubtedly helped to perpetrate the myth of the astral body. Despite there not being any scientific evidence of the astral worlds, there is an amazing amount of spiritual evidence especially surrounding the paranormal concept of astral projection. Astral projection, also known as astral travel, is a term used in esotericism to describe an intentional out-of-body experience, or OBE for short, that assumes the existence of a soul or consciousness called an astral body that is separate from the physical body and capable of traveling outside it throughout the universe. The idea of astral travel is ancient and occurs in multiple cultures. The modern terminology of astral projection was coined and promoted by 19th century theosophists. It is sometimes reported in association with dreams and forms of meditation. Some individuals have reported perceptions similar to descriptions of astral projection that were induced through various hallucinogenic and hypnotic means including self-hypnosis. There is no scientific evidence that there is a consciousness or soul which is separate from normal neural activity or one that can consciously leave the body and make observations. An astral projection has been characterized as a pseudoscience. On the other hand, there is some evidence that spontaneous out-of-body experiences are useful for psychotherapy. According to classical, medieval, and renaissance, hermeticism, neoplatonism, and later theosophists and Rosicrucian thought, 
The astral body is an intermediate body of light linking the rational soul to the physical body while the astral plane is an intermediate world of light between heaven and earth composed of the spheres of the planets and stars. These astral spheres were held to be populated by angels, demons, and spirits. The subtle bodies and their associated planes of existence form an essential part of the esoteric systems that deal with astral phenomena. In the Neoplatonism of Plotinus, for example, the individual is a microcosm of the universe. The rational soul is akin to the great soul of the world, while the material universe, like the body, is made as a faded image of the intelligible. Each succeeding plane of manifestation is causal to the next, a worldview known as emanationism. From the one perceives intellect, from intellect, soul, and from soul, in its lower phase or that of nature, the material universe. Often these bodies and their planes of existence are depicted as a series of concentric circles or nested spheres with a separate body traversing each realm. The idea of the astral figured prominently in the work of the 19th century French occultist Eliphas Levi, once it was adopted and developed further by theosophy, and used afterwards by other esoteric movements. Authors and experts, Herward Carrington, Sylvan Muldoon, Robert Peterson, and Jane Williams, claim that the subtle body is attached to the physical body by means of a psychic silver cord. The final chapter of the Book of Ecclesiastes is often cited in this respect. Before the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be shattered at the fountain, or the wheel be broken at the cistern. Sherman, however, contends that the context points to this being nearly a metaphor. Comparing the body to a machine with the silver cord, referring to the spine. Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians is more generally agreed to refer to the astral planes I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was called up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. This statement gave rise to the Visio Pauli, a tract that offers a vision of heaven and hell. A forerunner of visions attributed to Nugdalis as well as of Dante's Divine Comedy. Emanuel Swedenborg was one of the first practitioners to write extensively about the out-of-body experience in his spiritual diary. French philosopher and novelist Honoré de Balzac's fictional work, Louis Lambert, suggests he may have had some astral or out-of-body experience. Robert Monroe's account of journeys to other realms popularized the term OBE and were translated into a large number of languages. Though his books themselves only placed secondary importance on descriptions of method, Monroe also founded an institute dedicated to research, exploration, and non-profit dissemination of auditory technology for assisting others in achieving projection and related altered states of consciousness. Also known as Bob Monroe, he was a radio broadcasting executive who became known for his research into altered consciousness and founding the Monroe Institute. His 1971 book, Journeys Out of the Body, is credited with popularizing the term out-of-body experience. Monroe achieved worldwide recognition as an explorer of human consciousness and out-of-body experiences. His research beginning in the 1950s, produced evidence that specific sound patterns have identifiable beneficial effects on our capabilities. For example, certain combinations of frequencies appeared to enhance alertness, others to induce sleep, and still others to evoke expanded states of consciousness. According to his third book, Ultimate Journey, he dropped out of Ohio State University in his sophomore year due to a hospital stay for a facial burn that caused him to fall behind in his studies. During almost a year away from college, a desire to find work led him to become a hobo who rode freight trains. 
He returned to Ohio State to graduate after having studied pre-med, English, engineering, and journalism. According to his own account, while experimenting with sleep learning in 1958, Monroe experienced an unusual phenomenon which he described as sensations of paralysis and vibration accompanied by a bright light that appeared to be shining on him from a shallow angle. Monroe went on to say that this occurred another nine times over the next six weeks, culminating in his first out-of-body experience. Monroe recorded his account in his 1971 book, Journeys Out of the Body, and went on to become a prominent researcher in the field of human consciousness. Monroe later authored two more books on his experiments with OBE, 1985's Far Journeys and the 1994's Ultimate Journey. In 1962, the company moved to Virginia and a few years later changed the corporate name to Monroe Industries. In this location, it became active in radio station ownership, cable television, and later in the production and sale of audio cassettes. These cassettes were practical expressions of the discoveries made in the earlier and ongoing corporate research program. In 1985, the company officially changed its name once again to Interstate Industries Incorporated. This reflected Monroe's analogy of how the use of hemi-sync served as a ramp from the local road to the interstate in allowing people to go full steam ahead in the exploration of consciousness, avoiding all of the stops and starts. Robert Monroe's leadership of the entire program of development was supported for more than 50 years by many specialists who continue their participation to this day. His daughter, Lori Monroe, continued her father's research into consciousness and the mind's potential until her death in 2006 under the current direction of another of Monroe's daughters, Maria Monroe Whitehead, Monroe's stepson, A.J. Honeycutt, and Teresa West, president of Monroe Products. The company's objective is to continue to expand the Hemisync line of products and their benefits into markets worldwide. Controlled studies of the Institute's technology suggest that it is effective as an analgesic supplement and can reduce hospital discharge times. Which brings us to another interesting aspect of the astral world, avatars. An avatar is a concept in Hinduism that means descent. It's the material appearance or incarnation of a deity on earth. The relative verb to alight or to make one's appearance is sometimes used to refer to any guru or revered human being. The word avatar does not appear in the Vedic literature but appears in verb forms in post-Vedic literature and as a noun particularly in the Puranic literature after the 6th century CE. Despite that the concept of an avatar is compatible with the content of the Vedic literature like the Upanishads as it is symbolic imagery of the Saguna Brahman concept in the philosophy of Hinduism. The Rig Veda describes Indra as endowed with a mysterious power of assuming any form at will. The Bhagavad Gita expands the doctrine of avatara but with terms other than avatar. Theologically, the term is most often associated with the Hindu god, Vishnu, though the idea has been applied to other deities. Varying lists of avatars of Vishnu appear in Hindu scriptures, including the ten Dashavatara of the Garuda Purana and the twenty-two avatars in the Bhagavata Purana, though the latter adds that the incarnations of Vishnu are innumerable. The avatars of Vishnu are important in Vaishnavism theology. In the goddess-based Shaktism tradition of Hinduism, avatars of the Devi in different appearances, such as Tripura, Sundari, Durga, and Kali are commonly found, while avatars of other deities, such as Ganesha and Shiva, are also mentioned in medieval Hindu texts. 
this is minor and occasional. The Incarnation Doctrine is one of the important differences between Vaishnavism and Shaivism traditions of Hinduism. Incarnation concepts similar to Avatar are also found in Buddhism, Christianity and other religions. The scriptures of Sikhism include the names of numerous Hindu gods and goddesses, but it rejected the doctrine of Savior Incarnation and endorsed the view of Hindu Bhakti movement, saints such as Namdev, that formless eternal God is within the human heart and man is his own savior. Avatar literally means descent, a light, to make one's appearance and refers to the embodiment of the essence of a superhuman being or a deity in another form. The word also implies to overcome, to remove, to bring down to cross something. In Hindu traditions, the crossing or coming down is symbolism, states Daniel Basuk, of the divine descent from eternity into the temporal realm, from unconditioned to the conditioned, from infinitude to finitude. An avatar, states Justin Edwards Abbott, is a Sagana embodiment of the Nirguna Brahman or Atman. Neither the Vedas nor the principal Upanishads ever mention the word avatar as a noun. The verb roots and form, such as avatarana, do appear in ancient post-Vedic Hindu texts, but as the action of descending, but not as an incarnated person. The related verb, avatarana, is, states Paul Hacker, used with double meaning, one as the action of the divine descending, another as laying down the burden of man suffering from the forces of evil. Mahesh is an avatar of Lord Vishnu, the term is most commonly found in the context of the Hindu god Vishnu. The earliest mention of Vishnu manifested in a human form to establish Dharma on earth uses other terms such as the word Sambhavami in verse 4.6 and the word Tanu in verse 9.11 of the Bhagavad Gita as well as other words such as Akriti and Rupa elsewhere. It is in medieval era texts those composed after the 6th century CE that the noun version of avatar appears where it means embodiment of a deity. The idea proliferates thereafter in the Puranic stories for many deities and with ideas such as Ansha avatar or partial embodiments. The term avatar in colloquial use is also an epithet or a word of reference for any extraordinary human being who is revered for his or her ideas. In some contexts, the term avatara just means a landing place, site of secret pilgrimage, or just achieve one's goals after effort or retranslation of a text in another language. The term avatar is not unique to Hinduism. It is found in the Trikaya doctrine of Mahayana Buddhism, in descriptions for the Dalai Lama, in Tibetan Buddhism, and many ancient cultures. The manifest embodiment is sometimes referred to as an incarnation. The translation of avatar as incarnation has been questioned by Christian theologists who state that an incarnation is in flesh and imperfect while avatar is mythical and perfect. The theological concept of Christ as an incarnation as found in Christology presents the Christian concept of incarnation. According to Duyoye and Vroom, this is different from the Hindu concept of avatar because avatars in Hinduism are unreal and is similar to docetism. Sheth disagrees and states that this claim is an incorrect understanding of the Hindu concept of avatar. Avatars are true embodiments of spiritual perfection, one driven by noble goals in Hindu traditions such as Vaishnavism. The concept of avatars within Hinduism is most often associated with Vishnu, the preserver or sustainer aspect of God within the Hindu trinity, or Trimurti of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Vishnu's avatars descend to empower the good and fight evil thereby restoring Dharma. 
Traditional Hindus see themselves not as Hindu, but as Vaishnava, uh, the worshippers of Vishnu, Shaiva, the worshippers of Shiva or Shakta, the worshipper of the Shakti. Each of the deities has its own iconography and mythology, but common to all is the fact that the divine reality has an explicit form, a form that the worshipper can behold. The Vishnu avatars appear in Hindu mythology whenever the cosmos is in crisis, typically because the evil has grown stronger and has thrown the cosmos out of its balance. The avatar then appears in a material form to destroy evil and its sources and restore the cosmic balance between the ever-present forces of good and evil. The most known and celebrated avatars of Vishnu within the Vaishnavism uh, traditions of Hinduism are Krishna, Rama, Narayana, and Vasudeva. These names have extensive literature associated with them. Each has its own characteristics, legends, and associated arts. The Mahabharata, for example, includes Krishna, while the Ramayana includes Rama. The ten best-known avatars of Vishnu are collectively known as the Dashavatara, a Sanskrit compound meaning ten avatars. Five different lists are included in the Bhagavata Purana, where the difference is in the sequence of the names. Frida Matchett states that this resequencing by the composers may be intentional, so as to avoid implying priority or placing something definitive and limited to the abstract. Linga Sharira is a Sanskrit term for the invisible double of the human body, the ethereal body or etheric double, or astral body in some theosophical concepts. It is one of the seven principles of the human being according to theosophical philosophy. Rudolf Steiner, the founder of Anthroposophy, often referred to the etheric body, atherlibe, or life body, in association with the etheric formation forces and the evolution of man and the cosmos. According to him, it can be perceived by a person gifted with clairvoyance as being of peach blossom color. Steiner considered the etheric reality or life principle as quite distinct from the physical, material reality, being intermediate between the physical world and the astral or soul world. The etheric body can be characterized as the life force also present in the plant kingdom. It maintains the physical body's form until death. At that time it separates from the physical body and the physical reverts to natural disintegration. According to Max Heindel's Rosicrucian writings, the etheric body composed of four ethers is called the vital body, since the ether is the way of ingress for vital force from the sun and the field of agencies in nature which promote such vital activities as assimilation, growth, and propagation. It is an exact counterpart of our physical body, molecule for molecule and organ for organ, but it is of the opposite polarity. It is slightly larger, extending about one and a half inches beyond the periphery of the physical body. Samael Aunweor teaches that the vital body is the tetra-dimensional part of the physical body and the foundation of organic life. He states that in the second initiation of fire, the kundalini rises in the vital body. Then the initiate learns how to separate the two superior ethers from each other in order for them to serve as a vehicle to travel out of the physical body. In the teachings of theosophy, devas are regarded as living either in the atmospheres of the planets of the solar system, known as planetary angels, or inside the sun, known as solar angels. Presumably, other planetary systems and stars have their own angels, and they help to guide the operation of the processes of nature, such as the process of evolution and the growth of plants. Their appearance is reputedly like colored flames about the size of a human being, it is believed by theosophists that Davis can be observed 
when the third eye is activated. Some, but not most, devas originally incarnated as human beings. It is believed by theosophists that nature spirits, elementals like gnomes, undines, sylphs, and salamanders and fairies can also be observed when the third eye is activated. It is maintained by theosophists that these less evolutionary developed beings have never been previously incarnated as human beings. They are regarded as on a separate line of spiritual evolution called the Deva evolution. Eventually, as their souls advance, as they reincarnate, it is believed they will incarnate as Devas. It is asserted by theosophists that all of the above mentioned beings possess etheric bodies, but no physical bodies that are composed of etheric matter, a type of matter finer and more pure that is composed of smaller particles than ordinary physical plane matter. An out-of-body experience is a form of autoscopy, meaning literally seeing oneself, although the term autoscopy most commonly refers to the pathological condition of seeing a second self, or doppelganger. A form of spontaneous OBE is the near-death experience, or NDE for short. Some subjects report having had an OBE at times of severe physical trauma, such as near drownings or major surgery. Near-death experiences may include subjective impressions of being outside the physical body. Sometimes visions of deceased relatives and religious figures and transcendence of ego and spatio-temporal boundaries. Typically, the experience includes such factors as a sense of being dead, a feeling of peace and painlessness, hearing of various non-physical sounds, an out-of-body experience, a tunnel experience, the sense of moving up or through a narrow passageway, encountering beings of light and a godlike figure or similar entities, being given a life review, and a reluctance to return to life. Along the same lines as an NDE, extreme physical effort during activities such as high altitude climbing and marathon running can induce OBEs. A sense of bilocation may be experienced with both ground and air-based perspectives being experienced simultaneously. Falling asleep physically without losing awareness, the mind-awake-body-asleep state is widely suggested as a cause for OBEs voluntarily and otherwise. Thomas Edison used this state to tackle problems while working on his inventions. He would rest a silver dollar on his head while sitting with a metal bucket in a chair. As he drifted off, the coin would noisily fall into the bucket, restoring some of his alertness. OBE pioneer Sylvan Muldoon more simply used a forearm held perpendicular in bed as the falling object. Salvador Dali was said to use a similar paranoic critical method to gain odd visions, which inspired his paintings. Deliberately teetering between awake and asleep state is known to cause spontaneous trance episodes at the onset of sleep, which are ultimately helpful when attempting to induce an OBE. By moving deeper and deeper into relaxation, one eventually encounters a slipping feeling if the mind is still alert. This slipping is reported to feel like leaving the physical body. Some consider progressive muscle relaxation a passive form of sensory deprivation, deep trance, meditation, and visualization. The types of visualizations vary. Some common analogies include climbing a rope to pull out of one's body, floating out of one's body, getting shot out of a cannon, and other similar approaches. This technique is considered hard to use for people who cannot properly relax. One example of such a technique is the popular Golden Dawn Body of Light technique, brainwave synchronization via audio-visual stimulation. Binaural beats can be used to induce specific brainwave frequencies, notably those prominent in various mind-awake body-asleep states. Binaural induction of a body asleep for Hertz brainwave frequency was observed as effective by the Monroe Institute and some authors consider binaural beats
to be significantly supportive of OBE initiation when used in conjunction with other techniques. Simultaneous introduction of mind-awake beta frequencies detectable in the brains of normal, relaxed, awake individuals was also observed as constructive. Another popular technique uses sinus audial wave pulses to achieve similar results. And the drumming accompanying Native American religious ceremonies is also believed have heightened receptivity to other worlds through brainwave entrainment mechanisms. Sensory deprivation. This approach aims to induce intense disorientation by removal of space and time references. Flotation tanks or pink noise played through headphones are often employed for this purpose. Sensory overload, the opposite of sensory deprivation. The subject can, for instance, be rocked for a long time in a specifically designed cradle or submit to other forms of sensory stimulation to achieve the desired state. 